when I first went to stay with the John Fu. It gradually dawned on me that he could read my mind. And then I began to notice he had other unusual powers as well. He knew when things were going to happen in the future. And I must admit that it had me really fascinated. It opened whole new worlds of possibility that I'd never really taken seriously before. I guess he seemed to notice that my interest was heading off in that direction, so one evening he called me up short. He said, you know, the whole purpose for this practice aims at purity of heart. Everything else, he said, is just games. And that teaching really went to my heart. It reminded me of why I was there. What's really important in the practice is to make the, the heart pure. What does it mean to have a pure heart? When the Buddha talks about purity, it's largely training yourself not to think or act or speak in ways that cause anybody any harm, either yourself or other people. And the next question is, well, why do we harm one another? Usually it's out of fear. It might be carelessness, but deep down inside there's an element of fear. Because you think you can trust yourself not to do something bad. And then all of a sudden you find yourself threatened in one way or another. And you start your views start getting skewed. Things you ordinarily wouldn't want to do, you suddenly find yourself doing or saying or thinking. And it usually comes out of fear. You feel threatened. And once there's a threat, there's a reordering of your priorities, what's really important. So how are we threatened? Why is it that everybody seems to have a price? You push them far enough and they'll be willing to do all kinds of things that they know they shouldn't do. But they can convince themselves that it's okay in these circumstances. Well, what are those circumstances that are so threatening? I think it all comes down to the fact that, as they say in that very first question for the novice, as all beings subside on food. It's not just physical food he's, they're talking about here. It's, physical food is one type of food, of course, but there's also the food of contact, the food of yeah, what they call intellectual intention, and there's the food of consciousness. These are the things that we feed on. The body feeds on food, the mind feeds on these other things. You feel that we need these things in order to survive. That's how we keep going as beings. And when our food source seems to be threatened, we react. And that way we're no different from dogs and other animals. You threaten their food and they're going to snarl and bite. When we feel that our food is threatened, we snarl and bite too. So obviously the issue of purifying the heart comes down to learning how not to have to depend on food. This goes deep, because the habits of the mind are that it's feeding on everything. We think about interconnectedness as being a good thing, but basically interconnectedness is inter -be inner being is inner eating. That's what conditionality is all about. In fact, if anything could be proof that we're not really one, 
Just look at how beings feed on one another. No one is willingly food for anybody else. If we really were one, there wouldn't, we wouldn't have to keep feeding on one another in order to exist. There's a taking, there's an oppressing, there's a making yourself a burden on other people that's involved in the feeding. And it's a burden for you yourself to be constantly worried about your source of food. So worried that you can end up killing and stealing and doing all kinds of other things that you know isn't right. So how do we get past feeding? That's the issue if we want to purify the heart. And the first step is but just to look at the process as it is, as a feeding process, and look at the kind of things that are involved in feeding. The Buddha says to look at the process of eating physical food. In line with an analogy, it tells a story about a couple with their baby son going across the desert. They run out of food. And the question is, what are they going to do? And so they finally decide that at least have two of them survive instead of having all three die. And so they decide to kill the son and make his flesh into jerky, baby jerky. Huh. I'm sure it wouldn't sell anywhere. And then the Buddha asks, okay, when they eat, ate that baby jerky as they were going across the desert, would they eat it for fun or pleasure? And the answer is, of course not. Just to keep the body going. And they'd be crying, thinking about their son, that they had to do this. He said, that's the attitude you should have towards physical food. Not only flesh eating, but all kinds of eating. There's always suffering involved in the process of getting food to your mouth. The farmers suffer, the people who transport the goods suffer. There's work involved in fixing the food. It's just one big hassle. So that's why we have that contemplation every day. We eat food not for the purpose of beautifying, not for fun, simply to keep the body alive so we can practice the holy life. That's for the food of sensory contact. So much of our lives are spent in looking for enjoyable sensations. And when fear mongers come along and they say, well, you could die, you could be losing all your wealth, the economy could crash if you don't go along with our agenda. Largely becomes not only we're afraid of losing physical food, but also food of sensory contact. The nice shows we watch, the nice clothing we can get all the things that feel good through the senses. The Buddha said to look at that kind of food as, as if you were a flayed cow, always exposed on all sides. So no matter where you went, there would be little flies and things picking at your flesh. Because that's what it is, to depend on this kind of contact is like hoping for pleasant sensations from the flies. The food of it, intellectual intention, he said, is like being dragged off to a pit of burning coals, constantly on fire with this thought, that thought, wanting this, wanting that. And that's for the food of consciousness, he said, compare it to a man who's been caught by the king, and they spear him in the morning with a hundred spears. And the king asks the, his Henchman, okay, is he dead yet? Well, he's not dead yet. Okay, spear him again with another hundred spears at noon. Is he dead yet? Well, not quite yet. Okay, spear him again in the evening with another hundred spears. And of that's how the food of consciousness should be understood. The whole purpose of this is to turn your mind away from this kind of feeding. There seems to be a certain pleasure that comes from it. When we look at the process that you have to feed, you have to always look all the time for food, and there's so much suffering involved in the process. 
know, the only way this, these kind of images really can correspond to the way you sense these things is to make your mind really, really still, really quiet. In other words, use the breath as your food. In other words, as with physical food, you have to learn how to use the food of contact and intellectual intention and consciousness, but turn it into good, strong states of concentration. So you have something to compare. Okay, there's this kind of feeding, and then there's the ordinary kind of feeding that goes on out there. Which would you rather be involved in? When the mind is really still, and there comes a sense of ease, rapture, equanimity from the stillness. It gives you something to compare. And gives you a point of a perspective on your life. Do you want to spend your whole life running around feeding in these ways, knowing that if you're dependent on food in that way, you can't really trust yourself? You might have a price. I saw this right after September 11th. So many Buddhist teachers caved in. They wanted to make everyone sure that they were not pacifist, or they saw the need for war because afraid they're afraid they were going to lose their students, that they wouldn't be popular. And seeing that is really dismaying. You have to ask yourself, okay, you're the sort of person who, you know, when it comes to a certain threshold, you're willing to cave in, you're willing to give in, change your values. As long as you have to feed, there's always that potential. And if you can't trust yourself, who can you trust? And what kind of life is that? This is why we owe it to ourselves and to the people around us, the beings around us. It's to strengthen the mind to the point where it doesn't need to feed anymore. Strength is a mind, our conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. When these things are developed, the mind reaches the point where it doesn't have to depend on any kind of food for its happiness. They say that aurons have understood food and they're totally independent of nutriment. And as a result, you can't trace their path in the same way that you can't trace the path of birds in the sky. They can't be traced, but they're totally reliable, totally trustworthy. Because nothing could happen that would make them change their values. Because they don't depend on anything that can be affected by anything else. Technically, you can't even call them beings anymore. Because a being, as the Buddha said, is defined by where you're attached, where you're tied down. What you cling to. When there's no attachment, when there's no clinging, you can't be defined. That's another way in which the path can't be traced. Not only the path can't be traced, they can't be traced. That's what it means to have purity of heart. And that's what this practice is all about. And as John Fuang said, everything else is just games. And as we know, some games are pleasant, some games can get cruel. The playful way in which some people feed is can be cruel. 
So this is why purity of heart is such an important thing. It's an important gift for ourselves and for the people around us.